Welcome to season two of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Margarita Mooney Suarez. And I have been looking forward to having her on the program ever since I discovered her work. And she introduced me to uh, many great resources that I, I hope to dig into during our conversation today. Things that I know uh, you will be interested in knowing about uh, as educators and parents and administrators, people working in uh, the classroom and, and, and a part of this uh, renewal of, of good education uh, through the classical Christian tradition. Margarita received her BA in psychology from Yale University and her MA and PhD in sociology from Princeton University. Currently an associate professor in the Department of Practical Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. She teaches courses on philosophy of social science, Christianity and the liberal arts tradition, aesthetics, research message, uh, methods rather for congregational leaders and sociology of religion. Uh, Margarita also founded the Scala Foundation in 2016 and continues to serve as Scala's executive director. Scala's mission is to infuse meaning and purpose into American education by restoring a classical liberal arts education. So Dr. Margarita Moody Suarez, welcome to the program. Thank you, great to be here with you, Trey. Well, if memory serves correctly, my first contact with your work was uh, listening to a speech that you gave at the Acton Institute's 28th anniversary dinner back in 2019. And although I wasn't present, uh, I did find the recording on YouTube and enjoyed it immensely. And in that speech, you, you talked a lot about uh, essentially the role of virtue in sustaining a free society, which I know in so many ways is a core of, of your work. And that, of course, led me to uh, look for more things that you have uh, published and things that are available online, uh, where I discover, discovered sort of a smattering of essays um, in the Church Life Journal. That's put out by the University of Notre Dame. And then I discovered your book, The Love of Learning, Seven Dialogues on the Liberal Arts. And so perhaps let's just start with your work there. I, I'd love to know what your motivation was for writing that particular book and, and why did you choose dialogue as your approach? Well, thank you, Trey. It's really interesting to hear that you heard my story at the Acton Institute, because I think sometimes people see my credentials and don't realize that so much of how I think about the human person and the end of education and what I do in the classroom has been shaped by my own Hispanic background, being raised by a mother who came to the United States from Cuba when she was 20. And as I shared at the Acton Institute, my own curiosity as a college student taking me to Cuba in 1994 and realizing that the promises of social reform in Cuba had really turned out pretty empty. And that began this kind of intellectual quest that places like the Acton Institute helped me integrate my intellectual life with the richness of the Catholic social tradition and the Catholic moral tradition. So when I spoke at the Acton Institute was just when I had begun my own project, which I call Scala Foundation. It's a nonprofit I started because my day job, like many of you listening to this show, is I'm a teacher. I'm privileged to teach college students and graduate students, but I never had actually pondered what is the end of education. The kind of teacher training I had in the academy was really strong in certain aspects, but it focused mostly on passing on the subject material and developing proper assessments and setting up the classroom dynamic. And I thought all of that was great, but you asked me kind of, why did I write my book, The Love of Learning that came out a year ago? And why did I focus on dialogues? Well, I increasingly actually found that students were longing to have open-ended dialogues, but the college classrooms had become really politically charged and students weren't actually connecting 
to their deepest desires and to their own identity. They were always trying to anticipate how what they said might be heard and how they might be responded to. And so I began to try to work with students to try to recreate this kind of open dialogue in the classroom with, with the end of truth seeking. And I titled my book of dialogues, The Love of Learning, Seven Dialogues on Liberal Arts Education, because I wanted to speak to educators at all levels who were struggling with some of the same things I saw. Um, students feeling awkward about sharing openly in discussion, the overemphasis on tests as the only measure of passing on of a subject, or, and frankly, ultimately, what do we mean by teaching that teaching is a vocation? Um, and so the method of dialogue, I think, allows people to engage with really deep ideas about philosophy of education by listening to me in dialogue with seven other people who are exemplary educators and who come, the, 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 my um, collaborators in that book come from fields as diverse as psychology to physics, um, to music, political theory, English literature. And the question then becomes, what is the common philosophy of the human person that undergirds this excellence in teaching that they exhibit in their classrooms? Well, not only do you dialogue with contemporary educators, uh, people that you know we we could we could look up their work now and 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 maybe even get in touch with them via email or or go and attend a conference and hear them speak. But together, all of you in this book are in dialogue with thinkers from the past, and I'd like to delve into some of those individuals and their work uh, during the course of our conversation here. But before we do that, is perhaps by means of setting the stage, you mentioned philosophy and, and how it undergirds or underpins uh, what happens in education uh, in the classroom. And, and it really shapes just so much of, of how we experience and practice education, but also what we believe when we think about education and when we think about uh, the educator and, and the student. And so I'd like to put forward that uh, it seems to me that largely uh, teachers, myself included, uh, have just failed to understand really the, the deep rot that's at the core of our education system today. Now, we, we, we sense that there's a problem, um, but we don't necessarily know how to name it or know how to sort of follow the threads uh, back to uh, where these things started. And, and sometimes in our attempts to uh, restore or renew uh, certain things in education, um, we we don't really know where to, where to go back to and and find uh, sort of the the resources we need and, and I use that word intentionally to to really uh, resource ourselves to go back to the source uh, that that is uh, really at the heart of what we would love which is an education that is centered on things that are true good and beautiful we talk about this all the time in in classical Christian education and. One of the things I've observed uh, in going back to the sources, and, and people like you have helped me find these sources, is that there are some things that are, are just at the core of good education. And, and, I'm, and I wanna center our conversation on philosophy a little bit. And I promise our listeners, we'll get to practices, but it's really these uh, principles uh, that are at the heart of good education that we need to, uh, we need to wrestle with first. And some of the people that you dialogue with in your book uh, include uh, Jacques Maritain and uh, Luigi Giussani. And those names uh, may not be familiar to folks. I never knew who these guys were until I read your book. So first and foremost, thank you. But you put these two people uh, in some ways in conversation with John Dewey, uh, and that name may be more familiar. Uh, but let's do this, if, if, you're, if you're open to it. Can we just explore these three thinkers a little bit? And during the course of our conversation, we can only go so deep into it. But maybe let's just do an, an introduction to, to John Dewey first. And let's get a sense of how he's influenced um, not just our practices in contemporary education, but the way we think about education as a whole. Great. Absolutely. You know, before I go specifically into John Dewey, I want to respond to what you said about how teachers kind of struggling with what is their fundamental identity as a teacher. And you mentioned in your intro to me that part of my work is about bringing 
virtue back into education and into the social sciences. Well, there's a philosopher named Alasdair McIntyre who wrote a book called After Virtue. And his argument was that modern philosophy had gotten away from this core idea about the human person as being created for greatness, fallen in sin, in need of God's grace, but capable through freedom of developing the gifts and capacities that one has. And he has this great line that I, this, this great passage that I share a lot, which I think might help teachers name sort of what's gone wrong with education. He talks about how in the modern world, where all goods have been reduced to an instrumental exchange, that people feel that rather than being a whole human person, mind, body, and soul, so many teachers tell me when they walk in the classroom, sometimes they feel like a bureaucrat, right? Which their job is to administer tests and get people to the next level of the bureaucracy. Sometimes they feel like a therapist. The students are bringing uh, so many emotional you know, issues into the classroom that that seems to come to the forefront. Other times they feel like they're the reformer, right? The world is falling apart and it's our job as educators to fix it. Well, all of those aspects of the person are, are important, but the core of education is the formation of a free human person. And so what I would like to contrast, we'll talk about John Dewey, right? And then I'll contrast him with Jacques Maritain. So John Dewey, I actually think, as you alluded to, is part of the reason why education has gone down this path of bureaucratic therapeutic reform. And there is an alternative, and it's the alternative being lived and spread by the classical Christian movement, as well as by classical schools that are public. And they're drawing on a very different tradition of the human person. So who is John Dewey? First and foremost, he is a philosopher. He was not a K-12 educator, though his ideas have been widely adapted for public education, and oftentimes also in Christian education. John Dewey himself was not anti-Christian. He was raised in the Congregationalist tradition. He professed a kind of belief in God. However, his philosophy about the human person and about religion negated any kind of creedal statements, right? So for Dewey, and he says this actually very clearly in his philosophy books, he's most often read about his methods of education, which we'll get to in a moment. But what's not read as much is what he wrote about philosophy and faith, right? So he says in his book, A Common Faith, that ultimately what he's trying to do is to usher in the, the scientific revolution as the means of truth, right? That he even says that the new methods of inquiry and reflection coming from science have become for educated people today, the final arbiter of all questions of fact, existence and intellectual truth. He calls this a revolution in the seat of intellectual authority. That is the scientific revolution. Now. I'm all for scientific innovation and, you know, for new products coming out into the market. But what he's done here is a very direct rejection of the idea that there are truths about our being, which cannot be reduced to something material you put on a table and put it under a microscope. Now, I think the reason that this message from Dewey isn't always super clear is because he values the interior life and the soul and faith. The problem is it's never objective, right? So my story is not your story. My truth is not your truth. You know, your God and my God are the same God. I mean, there's no arbiter of truth in the quote unquote subjective realm. Mm. And so, you know, while this kind of neutrality might seem appealing in a diverse society, it's ultimately reducing truth to simply the scientific method. So this was the aspect of John Dewey that the philosopher you also mentioned, who I teach a lot, Jacques Maritain, was most concerned about. Um, Maritain, in his lectures given in the United States, you know, decades after Dewey's philosophy of education had spread through American public education. 
Jacques Maritain said that he feared that although Dewey's innovative methods of hands-on learning and teachers taking students out into nature, that all of that is great. But the problem is Dewey had grounded it on what Maritain called a stony, positivistic denial of the spiritual need of the human person. And he feared that the unintended consequences of reducing all of our ultimate values to purely subjective was going to be to turn teachers into bureaucrats, reformers, or therapists. In fact, Dewey said that. In Dewey, what is Dewey's vision of a teacher? Dewey's vision of a teacher is somebody who facilitates a scientific experiment. Mm. The teacher has no authority in Dewey's classroom. There's no tradition for Dewey, right? And what does the and so he says. What's the vision of the school? The school is the primary and most effective interest of social progress and reform. So what's happened, and I've just been reading this book by uh, Frederick Hess, Letters to an Education Reformer. Honestly, Trey, I can't think of another bigger, more bloated bureaucracy than that of our schools, which seem to come up with a new reform every five years, that's going to change everything. Yes. And what I want us to talk about is how do we get back to basics? Mm. How do we get back to basics? How do we get back to focusing on teachers and students and the dynamic interplay of two free human beings with subject matter and with core commitments and with a grounded sense of our dignity as human beings with an ultimate meaning and purpose where all of the scientific and the personal come together in creative, innovative ways that give life. Well, I, I think I think you're onto something there. And I wanna, I wanna spend a little bit more time uh, looking at, at Dewey's influence uh, before we before we delve into Maritain and Geosonic, because if if I'm if I'm understanding uh, Christopher Dawson's read on Dewey correctly in his um, in his book The Crisis of Western Education, uh, he just comes out and says that uh, Dewey and I'm paraphrasing Dawson here, but Dewey is is a deeply religious thinker and practitioner. It's just that religion for him is is essentially uh, the state. It's it's the uh, the democratic state, and so um, what I what I gleaned from that is that going back to this idea of authority, in so many ways, and whether or not Dewey intended this or not, uh, you can help me understand. But I think, in terms of reaping uh, what we've sown here, uh, some of the the fruit that we're tasting of Dewey's influence over over the decades is that authority at the end of the day, really rest in the self, right? Because that's sort of the democratic spirit in so many ways is, is sort of um, the, you know, I, an authority of oneself. And it's and it sort of turned into a rather absurd um, statement because not only am I an authority in and of myself, but you also have to accept exactly what I say about myself and what I say about the rest of the world. And all of a sudden we have these competing individual authorities and there is and there is a, a, a lack of... Um, authority that binds us all together, which is really, you know, what religion does properly, right? This idea of religio or, or tying things together. So so in some sense, it it's sort of unraveled, let's say, this religious idea he had. And then also, uh, there's there's just no tradition because there's no consistency. There's there's nothing being handed on. It's all sort of reinvented or reformed in, in each and every individual uh, as time goes on. Am I, am I reading uh, Dewey correctly through Dawson? I think you are, and I think um, it would probably be fair to describe what you just said as kind of a progressive view of, of history, right? The progressive view of history sees that whatever was good in the past is going to be preserved and maintained in whatever we do in the present, but there's no need to necessarily hold on to past traditions or to think the past might actually be telling us something that's more true than today. You know, there's just kind of presentism. Mm -hmm. And this futurism that, and, but you see the fundamental problem here is I think that progressives, and this is what Jacques Maritain is critiquing, they've forgotten that the philosophy of the human person, which Dawson shares and which most Christians shares is that we're actually flawed and sinful. Right. And that rather than history being unilateral, self-directed progress, right? You just said like the 
the self is at the center. Well, for the progressives, human perfection is the self-perfection of the self, right? Mm -hmm. And that's actually, by the way, a pretty heavy bar for anybody to meet, which is why I think ultimately it leads to the denial of ultimate truth, because who can really perfect himself, right? Um, so there's this idea that, yeah, the self is at the center and the self perfects itself and taking the inputs that it needs from the environment. So the school and the teacher just kind of provides inputs to the self-directed self that has no need of discipline to get to that perfection. There's no self sacrifice, right? So it, it, without a guide of some kind, a transcendent God, a tradition, an ultimate truth, the self-seeking becomes self-centered rather than self-gift. Yes. Um, it seems that uh, this, this pursuit of, of self-improvement uh, and, and, and the development of the self in this way um, flies in the face of what the Christian tradition has always tried to, to teach us, which is the denial of self. And, and, and what that leads to in so many ways is uh, what has been termed a, a burnout culture. I think this is Han. Uh, I'm forgetting uh, his full name, but there, there's, there's a contemporary uh, philosopher who's sort of thinking about sort of the, the impact on this, this constant self-improvement uh, track that is really fed to us from uh, from the time we are are enrolled in our first um, you know activities as as in preschool, and sort of just you know this this is you know what it means to be an educated person or this is what it means to sort of put yourself on this track for success, uh, which is a very different vision of education uh, than what we hear about in classical Christian circles, which is sort of this return to scole or this sort of resting in uh, truth or trusting in the tradition or subscribing to an authority above the self, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think, look, I got into this because I cared about being a good teacher and because I cared about helping my students. And I think like anyone listening to this podcast, the students bring into the classroom the popular culture that they're absorbing around them. And also teacher training programs aren't actually addressing some of these core questions. They're rightly so focused on, like I said, how do you run a classroom and how do you measure student success? But if, the, if our view of the teacher is that actually this is an encounter of two free human beings and the end goal is really to develop a person who can judge wisely and act rightly, we've got to address moral questions. All education is moral education. Mm, that's right. And teaching is always moral. Now, you mentioned human freedom here, right? So again, as persons who are Christian, yes, you're correct that the perfection that God wants for us requires self-denial. But that self-denial comes with the rightly ordered exercise of our freedom to give ourselves to God, right? Because that's the ultimate kind of paradox of Christianity is that we have a God who loves us enough that he gives us the freedom to love him back. And to do that, we have to choose to do that because we can also choose no. So we need self-discipline, but the ultimate goal of that self-discipline is the gift of self, right? And it's the fulfillment of self that comes from the gift of self, right? So the discipline is like, it's like working out. If you want to have your body be healthy, you need to take steps to do what's good for it and say no to what's bad for it, similar to the soul, right? Mm -hmm. So Maritan, by all means, believes in human freedom. And he's trying as a philosopher to grapple with so much of modern enlightenment philosophy that, as you rightly pointed out, is all focused on the self and all focused on kind of the freedom of the self and portrays Christianity or any kind of other uh, world religion that upholds that there's a common good as kind of squashing the person's freedom. And Maritain says, no, 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 no. The freedom that God gave us is freedom to choose what's right. And if in education, we're not presenting students with the concrete substance of what they can use their freedom to choose or reject, then nobody's truly free, right? We have this mistaken notion of freedom that like we're just let our impulses go and we just respond, you know, like a ping pong ball or something. That's not freedom. That's called being purely reactive. Freedom has to be directed. 
And this is what Maritan thinks that a proper education does. It helps us direct our freedom. That's right. And, and in the directing of our freedom, it's not like we are left without things to do with our bodies and with our time. Uh, you know, we're not suggesting that, that somehow um, a rejection of, of Dewey's philosophy will mean that all of a sudden, you know, that there are no, there's no activity uh, in the classroom or in the school. Um, and one place to start uh, in, in, in referencing, you know, the tradition is just to think about uh, the 14 acts of mercy. You know, there, there's the, the spiritual acts and the corporal acts. I mean, there's plenty of work to be done, right? There are, there's good work to be done. And so it's, it's not like we're going to sort of have to start from scratch, sort of thinking about what we should be spending our time doing. And in the classroom, and I'm sure we'll get to this, because I do want to know how these, how these philosophies play out, because it seems that, you know, one of the things that keeps us from uh, turning a critical eye to some of the, the deeper philosophical underpinnings of education uh, is that, you know, we, we find value in um, things like learning by doing or problem solving, or as you said, encountering, in, uh, encountering nature. Uh, and, and we have to give credit where credit is due. In some way, uh, people like Dewey um, and, and even Rousseau um, sort of turned our attention to these things, reminded us of some things. Now, what they kind of uh, carted in, <laughs> you know, in addition to these, um, these positive elements, was a really rotten uh, philosophy that uh, I, th I, would, I would just go ahead and put forward as being very anti-human, uh, sort of in its, in its fullest flowering. Um, because it does disconnect us from um, really what is at the heart of human condition and, and this denial of, of objective truth as you've laid out. So maybe this is a good place to turn to, uh, to Maritan. And, and I've been reading on your recommendation, his education at the crossroads. And, and I'll say up front that I'm only halfway through it, so I can't speak to uh, everything that he says in here. But Tell us a little bit about what he's up to in this book and, and how is he in conversation with, with Dewey here? Well, look, I do also want to get us to the practical and that book is a great read. The first chapter is where he lays out the popular misconceptions about education. And basically the number one misconception is that education is a question of method. He says, no, education is about the question of the nature of the human person. But from that, in chapter two, he lays out a vision. Okay, well, what does this mean for the curriculum of schools? And he addresses that. And what does this mean for the vision of what is a teacher, right? And so I think he lays out a vision for what so many people in the classical education world are doing, right? Returning to the trivium and the quadrivium, which has been handed down on to us through ancient wisdom, that there are primary ways of knowing the truth, science, math, music, but also um, experience in nature, religion, because this is who we are as human beings. And chapter two lays out a beautiful vision of teaching as a dynamic interplay between the teacher and the student where both are engaging in their freedom, right? So he says there's plenty of good in Dewey's method, but that what Dewey has lost sight of is the tradition of the curriculum that is like a proposal to students about the past, which is gonna shape their identity and shape their future. And that Dewey has no vision of teaching, actually, of the art of teaching, right? Teaching isn't a scientific experiment. It's an art, it's That's a right. dynamic interplay. And so it frees teachers from having to be bureaucratic reforming therapists. It's an art where the teacher encounters the subject and encounters the student. And the end of teaching is to awaken the student's own desire to know. So they exercise their capacities to grasp the reality that's being presented to them and adhere to it and form strength of judgment. Then Maritan goes on to say in the other chapters, we don't wanna limit education to what happens in the classroom. Another thing I find so exciting about the classical school movement is how they're trying to reintegrate classroom education with what's happening at church on Sunday, with, with, yes. with what's happening at home. As I mentioned, part of what's happened with public education, it's becoming more and more reforming and it's becoming more and more all encompassing, right? No, Maritan thinks that education, broadly speaking, is anything we do to shape the next generation. And he actually thinks that families and churches are the primary seats of education. Schools come in and they have a role to play, 
but they can't take over the role of families and they can't take over the role of faith communities. So his vision is that this model of the curriculum and this vision of teachers doesn't become all of society. Kind of like you said, for Dewey, the self is at the center supposedly, but ironically, the school becomes the organizing principle of all of our democratic participation. Well, wait, 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 what? Like what about everything else, right? So Maritain wants to rescue this idea of a kind of ordered collaboration between sectors of society dedicated to educating the young. And so then he concludes, I think, with a big vision of the common good. Um, and ultimately, you know, he's known as a kind of neo Thomist philosopher, but his wife was a poet. He cared deeply about fine arts. And he ultimately comes back to this question of, of love, right? And why should we be hopeful? He's talking in the middle of the 1940s when the Nazis are advancing across Europe and when the victory had not yet been won. But his hope for the future does not come from a progressive philosophy that sees all of history is getting better all the time, but rather as this belief in a love that is so strong that it gives itself to human beings who can then imitate that love and share it. And this is why we should be hopeful because this objective truth we believe in is beautiful and is the source of love and can bring hope even into our dark times. I think that's beautifully said. In so many ways, what, what Maritan is describing, it seems to me, is, is the role of education within community at large. And you know, we use the word community a lot. It's it, it can it can it can sort of lose its meaning, but let's not forget that in order to have a community, you know, you have to have a common <laughs> unity. And what you just described in terms of the school and the home and the church all working together, all working together. Um, I would even go so far to say is um, uh, when we think of the home, uh, thinking of a household um, versus perhaps uh, some of the more uh, modern ideas of, of the nuclear family. Um, again, this is also broadening our horizons to um, humans living together, working together uh, under truth and, uh, and within a tradition, uh, something that's worthy of being conserved and preserved and handed on from generation to generation. I think out of our heart of hearts, this is what we want. And, and what we're seeing playing out in, uh, as a result of Dewey's influence, and it's so amazing that, that, that a philosopher can have such an impact. Uh, this is why I think we need to be very careful um, uh, in, in helping students uh, grow into uh, be philosophers themselves uh, and, and do work that is a part of a, a tradition that uh, is going to pass on the things that need to be passed on because uh, sort of one sort of uh, weak link in the chain, so to speak, uh, well, we're just reaping uh, the, the fruit of all of this. Uh, it's, it's really phenomenal to see how much impact uh, a work of philosophy can have on, on the way we think about education because I'm convinced that, that the conversation we're having uh, in some sense requires us to step outside of ourselves and to, to put aside a lot of um, preconceived ideas about education because, uh, you know, and I don't know your background in terms of your schooling, but, you know, very few people alive really received the tradition through their education. If we got it at all, we got it through church and, and family. Yeah. Well, maybe Maritan's vision of education resonated with me because I was fortunate to be uh, educated in the Catholic parochial system. And what that means is that there were schools and I were part of a parish, right? So I experienced this kind of unity where most of the, I mean, I was in a small town in Maryland, Frederick, Maryland. It's grown a lot since I was a kid, but, you know, my community was this kind of unity between family, church, and school, and everything was kind of geographically close by. We weren't being bused an hour away. My brothers went to the same school. We had the same teachers. And so, and of course, the Catholic school system, at least when I was going through school, though this has changed a little bit, the religious sisters who taught us were teaching from a tradition that their orders had been founded to preserve. So there was a philosophy of the human person, an emphasis on creativity, contemplation, knowing science, math, reading. I mean, it was a beautiful form of education. So I did experience all of this. And I think when I started to feel fragmented, ironically, was when I got into Yale, because then suddenly 
there was so much of an emphasis on the freedom of the person and the self. And suddenly everything was like, you know, everything was relativistic about the truth. People were very hesitant to believe in truth. They might believe that there are different forms of the truth and that we can all live together peaceably pursuing these different forms of the truth. But suddenly there's really no right answers. Um, and that then I think ultimately leaves, um, well, then why is the life of the mind important? If there's no answers to these questions, maybe I should just be an engineer, a scientist, a lawyer, an economist. And well, what's happened? People going to the Ivy Leagues don't study humanities anymore. They study those fields that I just said, right? Why? Because they're skills that, and they're skills that translate into money and that these schools are very well networked to help you place in. So I saw the decline of an understanding of the human person in these institutions that were founded on these ideas and have the best resources to preserve these ideas. But I'm just not sure that the faculty, the administration and the board believes in the tradition around which these schools were founded. There are pockets of it, right? But they've taken the kind of broadening of the mission so far that there's not any core. And similarly, when I taught at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, they actually changed their original mission from the charter, which was to educate citizens and freedom and virtue. And they changed that to just you know, pass on pieces of knowledge. It, it, it just, it becomes vapid, right? There's no mention of the public good anymore. There's no mention of the citizens and there's no mention of, of truth. So what are our state universities doing then? They're essentially becoming credentialing systems. And so the students feel like they're just one more number in a system and that their lives don't have meaning and purpose. I taught wonderful students in North Carolina, most of whom had been through public high schools and were now in the flagship public school. They had never been exposed to questions about moral truth or civic virtue, all of these things that would have been considered public education, even when Dewey was around. They considered civic virtue and public good. But over time, and this was Maritan's warning, right? Over time, if you take Dewey at his word, there's no right answers to those questions. So rather than getting this robust public sphere, we get an even more utilitarian, narrow, bureaucratized, credentialized, and gargantuan public education system. So in the, in the time we have left, I want to hear from you a little bit about how you got into the classical education movement and why you see this movement taking off. I mean, I just came from the Society for Classical Learning in Dallas, where I gave several lectures and workshops. There was a thousand teachers there in person, 2,000 more in line, oh, sorry, online listening. I also lectured at the Acton Institute um, in their summer program with, I mean, the room was packed full of people. People were sitting on the floor. There were probably from 10, 20 different nations in there and all across the US. I asked how many were teachers, like three quarters of the hand went up. When I asked the teachers how many had read Dewey, three quarters of the hands went up. When I asked how many had read Maritan, one quarter. When I asked how many had read Jasani that I want to get us to, one, one hand went up. So tell me a little bit about how you got in the classical school movement and why you think it's important for classical educators to hear more from us today about Maritan and also Jasani. Well, it's very kind of you to ask that question. And, and I, I do want to... Uh... Uh, return our focus to, uh, to, to your reading of Giosani, because I think what he has to say and what you have to say uh, about his work is, is, is really the most important thing here. But it's, it's a good question you ask about sort of uh, how I got into um, reading these things in the first place. And I'd really just have to just really uh, give credit to my, to my parents and, and, and the education I received. I was homeschooled uh, as a child. And so uh, in some sense, I just grew up um, either in in our own home, which was filled with books, uh, or uh, going to uh, the church where my, my father was a minister and where my mother wrote curriculum and spent many hours uh, uh, putting together materials for teachers. Um, so in some in some ways, I was sort of raised in a in a musty old church library, and just just always had books at my fingertips, and so I was. Uh, very early on, initiated into the habit of of surrounding myself with books, reading books, and turning to books for for answers, and 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 also, um, you know, for for conversation partners. 
know, to to write in the margins of things and to to enter into dialogue as we started out our conversation uh, with with these thinkers from the past. Um, the the way I grew up in church, uh, you know, ha having a deep reverence for tradition and for um, uh, the preservation of of certain things that that can be very quickly forgotten, um, and and we can see the the danger of of leaving certain things behind and 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 thinking about you know the, these these deeply human and existential questions that you know the importance of knowing that I'm not the first person in the history of humanity to to ask these things and and to know that there are there are things uh, in, in books that I can find uh, that will will speak to uh, you know the, the the heart's deepest questions. And I, I ended up going uh, to a, a large state school. I, I attended Virginia Tech, and I was fortunate to be a part of the Corps of Cadets there, uh, where I received a commission and went on to, to, to serve in, in the United States Army. Uh, but if I hadn't been a part of that small core, you know, a relatively small group on campus, colleges are really in name only. Um, one of my claims of fame is my graduate school, I'm, I'm the last uh, graduating class to receive a diploma that says uh, Milligan College because they, they, they decided to become a university. And we won't get into all the details of that, but I think they should have stayed at college. <laughs> uh, because what, what we're finding is um, students who are largely looking to be a part of a community of, of readers are finding themselves lost in a sea of well, I don't know what to describe it, but it's it's not it's not oriented towards any one thing like a university is supposed to be, right? It, it's really you know what are you here to do? What are you here to get out of this? And um, and sort of where are you going next? And so the Corps of Cadets gave me a, a commission, and so I, I was on a track, but um, I found myself just just very dissatisfied with the the university experience. And it really wasn't until I kind of got out into the, you know, the workforce and, and, and being married. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, the thing that really turned my attention back to a tradition, back to um, the sources, so to speak, uh, was, was becoming a father, knowing that I had to, to give something to my son. I had to have something to hand on to him. Wow. That's beautiful. I mean, you said a lot there, but I think what you said at the end, I think really resonates because I think everyone's deepest desire as human beings is to form a life shared with other people and pass on something meaningful to the next generation. And that doesn't mean that as fathers or mothers, we don't learn from the next generation, but we certainly intuitively think it's part of our role is to help bring up this, this, this new human being and then see what comes of that mysterious adventure of becoming a parent. And so why isn't schooling similar to that? And that's kind of the starting point for Jasani. You know, he sort of says, and your life story exemplifies this, how do we go from kids who left alone with books and their thoughts are excited to learn and will pick up this book and ask this question. And then somehow at some point in life, they get transferred into one of these bureaucratic machines and that love of learning is gone and the mystery is gone. And without the mystery, how do you get the solidarity that forms community? You don't, you essentially get people as you described pursuing their own self-interest and that becomes pretty, pretty dry. So I think where Jasani comes in here and I read him because students who I knew, former students of mine who had become teachers had read him. He was an Italian Catholic priest. He did his work with students, mostly in Italy, but he started in the 1950s. And then his students took his method of education around the world to Brazil, Latin America, Spain, the United States. And his vision, again, similar to Maritan, is that one of the most important things we do as a society is educate the next generation. And he was really worried about Marxist ideas spreading in Italy, which saw the world as a fundamentally split between oppressed and oppressors. 
And therefore, education either had to be abandoned for the revolution or had to become a tool for the revolution, which is frankly the vision of Paulo Freire, whose book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is also taught, maybe because people like his emphasis on dialogue, but they don't read the part where dialogue, the end of dialogue is the promotion of the Marxist revolution. And he doesn't believe in dialogue for the oppressor. So it, it's, it's a little confusing what Freire really means. Well, Jasani wants to take what's good about education as being the searching for oneself and developing of one's identity and knowing one's story. But he rightly says, as human beings, we're born into something. We're born into a tradition. We're born into a civilization. And it's a crime to deprive the young of knowing from whence those traditions and civilizations came. Now, it may be that they use their freedom to reject that. But you can't begin with by stripping them of the past. This is a horrible mistake, and it's the progressive mistake we talked about earlier. You cannot strip the young of the past and expect them to have a foundation upon which to build the future. And so what Jasani is trying to do is build on the long Catholic intellectual, spiritual, moral tradition, uphold the good of dialogue and communion and solidarity, but show that to get those goods of communion and solidarity, you have to begin with tradition and authority. That tradition and authority are not somehow in, in competition with our freedom. They are, the, they are the framework that gives our freedom its orientation. But he calls his book, The Risk of Education, because sometimes adults who have reached a point of certainty about tradition and authority are afraid to actually let the young engage their own freedom and ask the big questions and question authority or question tradition. He wants the young to be able to do that, but to do it with the certainty that the, true, that the truth exists and that the end of questioning isn't to stop in skepticism. If you're asking that question, well, guess what? 2,000 years has been written about that question. That was humbling for me. You know, I think I'm so smart because I come up with some question. I haven't come up with too many questions that other people haven't asked before. And I think we're educating a generation of people if they've not been exposed to tradition who think what they're saying is new. And in fact, they're just parroting what other people have said. And they're not willing to even take the time to read the books that have been written to address that question. And yet they say there's no certainty, but they're awfully certain about their politics, right? Or they're awfully certain about what you need to do, but they're not certain that there's truth. I mean, it's, it becomes very confusing. And this is why I began to be concerned that education was passing on a kind of nihilistic or you know, a, a view of the world that denies that there's ultimate truth and meaning. So I do think these philosophical debates that we're talking about are extremely practical. And I think the people listening will hopefully take away from this talk that we've had that mystery and tradition and authority have a place in the classroom. And they're not the antithesis of identity or community, but rather the way that we get there. Uh, that's wonderful. Well, I, I hope that this is the beginning of, of many more uh, conversations about these topics. I hope people will take this and, and will pick up your book uh, um, and, and read your dialogues and, and then also go on to read Maritan and, and Giosani. You can do it. Um, uh, the, you know, there are so many um, things that are uh, not only accessible, but really also just worth, worth spending time uh, wrestling with. And as you advise at, at the end of your, your book of dialogues, um, getting together with other people and, and talking through these ideas with them, uh, reading in community. I think these are all things that will help uh, not only name, as we've tried to do in this conversation, some of the ills that we're suffering from, really give a diagnosis, but also give a lot of encouragement and some practical wisdom uh, in terms of uh, what we should be doing moving forward. And uh, you know, one of the things you, you made me uh, think about in your description of Giassani's work is that uh, one of the things that's very in vogue right now, and you know, there's some good reasons for this, is uh, the approach to knowledge as sort of a, your primary role is to deconstruct it, take it apart. And, and this was kind of me in, in my 20s. And maybe this is ju just germane to being a 20-something uh, in, 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 in our day and age. Um, and there's something good there. And I think Giosani names it. He says, yeah, that's, 
that's something that you each individual person needs to do is is look at what they've been given and and look at it in its uh, sort of smaller components and 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 examine it very closely. Um, but of course, you know what I now know as a father, as I build this house of bricks, let's say to, for my son to live in or for my daughter to live in, um, I know that they're going to look at each individual brick. And some of those bricks, they may be, be really tempted to just toss over their shoulder. And wow, I know all the blood and sweat and tears that went into that one particular brick that they're just ready to throw out. Uh, and it's not just my blood, sweat, and tears, but it's, it's you know, this long story of people handing down things and, and, and contributing to this, uh, this, this house that we can live in together. And so my hope is that um, through affirming the, the need to, to deconstruct or to look closely at things in, in their uh, smaller components, um, we can also give uh, our students and children um, the hope uh, to have faith that um, that as they live, uh, they'll start to see how all these pieces work together, and and ideally, as Yusani you know puts forward, the life of the teacher itself is an example of that. Um, it's not just something you know that I'm being paid to tell you as your teacher. It's not just something that I want to work through you because you know this is kind of what you're being asked to do at this point in your life uh, to kind of go through this program to move on to the next thing. No, this is something that I'm trying to live out. These are books I'm wrestling with. Uh, these are ideas that I'm thinking through really as the first student. I'm just a little bit further ahead down the road than you are. And if we can give students that vision, I think that will in some ways sort of affect the, um, the attitude of the student. Um, because they'll they'll see it as something we're, we're working on together, and and in that sense, it's something that's um, not passing, but rather rather um, sort of this perennial sort of engagement with with things that are true, good, and beautiful. Yeah. Well, listen. Just as some concluding thoughts, I thought what you said was really important. That Chasani is open to letting people ask big questions, but not deconstruction for the sake of deconstruction. Right? He uses this image of the backpack. Like when we come into the world, we all are carrying a backpack. We need to take things out of it to examine it. But then we need to decide what's going to be our backpack. What are our core commitments? What are our core principles? And so. Um, so, and I think that that journey is, should be an exciting one with a sense that there is, um, that there is truth at the end. So as a follow-up to the Love of Learning book, right, um, what I, I've actually got another book of dialogues that's just come out. It's called The Wounds of Beauty, Seven Dialogues on Art and Education. And although we won't be able to get into that too much today, it takes the same format, right? It's conversations I had with scholars, artists, poets, painters, um, historians working in education today and talking to them about the liberal arts tradition in particular the place of beauty because beauty is something that modern philosophy really struggles with because it's hard to reduce beauty to its use value or something that can be measured right beauty is it, it orients our intuitions it's an experience of a transcendent truth but yet there's been so many misconceptions about beauty as being purely in the eyes of the beholder or purely about my emotions that goes against the classical understanding of beauty as actually expressing the integrity and the unity of the cosmos. So I actually think beauty in its mysterious but yet experiential nature is what helps break this dichotomy between the objective and the subjective. Because it's not true that the objective is only the material and that the subjective is only kind of just gushy feelings. We're meant to integrate those two things and beauty does that for us. And the more we experience beauty, the more we become creatures who can apprehend reality by seeing reality in front of us, right? We have to teach the young to see the true and the good. And beauty helps train us, helps us open up our eyes. So that's the next book that I've just published. And I really believe in kind of small learning groups. You know, I told teachers at the Society for Classical Learning that if your school has a reading group and wants to adopt either of these books, The Love of Learning or The Wounds of Beauty, to visit my website where there's a form you can fill out to get copies of the book or send me an email and I'll try to send you the form. But if you can go through the website, that's even better. And thanks to some donors, I can ship out a limited number of those books to schools that are requesting them. 
that are requesting them because I think the face-to-face -face interaction between teachers walking with each other and countering the tradition and then asking, how does this apply to my second grade math classroom? How does this apply to my high school uh, science classroom? You know, what are you doing in your context? You know, you know your subject and you know your context. And what I'm trying to do is give you some, some ideas that maybe you've encountered, but you want to encounter more deeply, or maybe you've never encountered. But I want to reawaken your curiosity and really your love for the, for the vocation of being a teacher. Because right now, I see so much hope in parents and teachers who are taking on the tremendous task of educating the next generation with all the risks and uncertainties and challenges of raising free human beings who have free will and use it for good in ways that's inspiring and for not good in ways that's concerning. And I personally do this work that I do through Scala, which is I do, you know, in line with my job as a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, but increasingly with conferences and books and programs for teachers, because I myself as a full-time teacher want to share with you the insights and the wisdom that I wish I had had when I started my teaching career. And as these new schools start and as more parents homeschool and as more public schools are trying to get back to basics, I'm trying to put forth some core principles, some elementary ideas and put them out there and then let you figure out what exactly that looks like for your community, for your faith tradition, for the kinds of students that you serve. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share these wonderful ideas and to dialogue with you. I loved hearing your stories and I'm so grateful that you take the time to, to bring people like me on your show. Well, I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you for your time and thank you for introducing me to Maritan as well as Giassani through your work. And I hope we can uh, continue uh, passing those good things on by introducing people to uh, the things that you're doing through, through Scala and through your, your various uh, programs to support teachers, parents, and administrators. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, and please do visit Scala Foundation's website and sign up for our newsletter and look at some of our resources on YouTube, which is where Trey found me the first time. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a father who is in heaven.